I've lived in, through an amazing time when it comes to technological advancement, particularly in the field of marine science, and you just saw some wonderful examples of that. It's been amazing. When I was a college kid, I didn't have laptops. We had these big mainframes, but now we're actually strapping laptops to marine animals like sharks. And we're learning where they go and what they do, and, and these findings are absolutely amazing. So I'm going to tell a story today about trying to advance the technology to try to fill in the blanks about these amazing animals. And it's a personal story, but it's a story also of collaboration. It's a biologist working with marine engineers and even filmmakers to reach a, a goal we never thought we could reach. And the personal side of this story is about a kid who had a dream, and I hope it's a lesson about chasing dreams. And it's even a testament, perhaps, to the simple fact that even people like me can make new discoveries. This story started a long time ago in a Connecticut suburb of New York City. I was one of seven kids, and we didn't live very close to any major water body except Long Island Sound. And Long Island Sound in those days was pretty ugly. It was dirty, it was muddy, and it scared the hell out of me. So I didn't get very close to the ocean in those days. I actually learned about the ocean on television. And my biggest inspiration in those days was a guy named Jacques Cousteau, an explorer, an inventor, an ocean engineer, an eloquent man who went to places nobody had ever gone before and filmed them and put them on television. I was enamored. I loved it. I even wore a little red hat around the house. <laughs> Just ask my sisters. <laughs> 1975, I graduated from eighth grade. That same year, a movie came out named Jaws. And Jaws had a huge impact on me. And although it pulled a lot of people out of the water, it actually pushed me into it. I, I became obsessed with sharks. And I became obsessed with a character in that film known as Matt Hooper. He was chasing this big white shark around that was eating people. And what I learned from that film is not that white sharks eat people. I learned that this guy was doing a job I wanted to do. I wanted to be Matt Hooper. So I dove a little bit into the literature back in those days, and it was remarkable to me how little we knew about what was arguably one of the most charismatic marine animals on Earth, the great white shark. 1979, four years later, I graduated from high school. That same year, a scientist by the name of Frank Carey at Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution did pioneering research for the first time on white sharks in the Atlantic Ocean. He put a little tiny acoustic transmitter on that shark and followed it for three and a half days. This was known only monumental work from the perspective of learning about the biology of the white shark for the first time and spying on it but it also rattled the world because he was using a new technology, a little acoustic pinger to follow a fish. And what he showed is that the shark dove down to the bottom occasionally. And he could show these movements very, very well using his acoustic transmitter, but he had no clue what the shark was actually doing. And after Frank tracked that fish, white shark research stagnated in the Atlantic Ocean because we could not predictably go out and find this species. This is just the tiny glimpse of the track off the coast of Long Island that Frank Carey did that year. He moved from one end of Long Island to the other. It was just a glimpse, a snapshot into the natural history, the behavior of that animal over those three days. And I want you to keep that image in your mind as I explode what we did after that. Fast forward 30 years. With perseverance, tenacity, a little bit of skill, hard work, and a lot of luck, I transformed my world into that of a marine biologist studying sharks. I got to follow a dream I had as a child. And I worked on a number of shark species, not only off the coast of Massachusetts where I'm working, but all over the world. And that was wonderful experiences. At the same time over that period, the US government passed laws that would protect marine mammals. This happened in 1973. Over the course of the next 40 years, marine mammals, seal populations started to recolonize the northeastern United States after being decimated. 
and populations began to rebound and huge numbers of seals were everywhere. Well, for every highly abundant resource, there's usually a predator. And that predator is the white shark. So with the new cafe that had just opened off Cape Cod, <laughs> along came a very famous customer. And that customer allowed us for the very first time predictable access to this species to begin to study the bio biology of it, its behavior, its ecology, to pick up where Frank Carey had left off dozens of years ago. And I was surprised. I couldn't believe there were white sharks right in my backyard. <laughs> so I wanted to be a shark biologist growing up, and so I get to be a shark biologist. I'm in Massachusetts, and then the holy grail of all sharks shows up, the great white shark, in my backyard. So I'm poised at the right place at the right time, and this is where luck really calculates into this. So we started tagging these these sharks with all kinds of brand new technologies, technologies that had been used in other parts of the world and that had just started to really reveal amazing things about these animals. So we got out there, we started applying these tags. And some of these tags were very, very similar to the technology that Frank Carey used all those years ago, acoustic technology. And we put them in some of our favorite sharks. This is Curly. Curly became really popular in 2010. And Curly was one of the first sharks to get a highly sophisticated satellite tag in the Atlantic that told us where she was whenever she came to the surface. And so what did we learn? We learned that some of the early work done by Frank Carey was just a tiny little snapshot of what these sharks actually do in the Atlantic Ocean. We exploded what we knew about this species. And it was remarkable to us. And it was very similar work that was being done in the Indian Pacific Oceans that showed that white sharks aren't just coastal animals. They move about, and they move off into offshore areas. And thanks to my friends at OSEARCH, who helped us tag some of these sharks, we were delivering these data online every day as they happened. So the general public could go out and learn as we learned what those sharks were doing. And some of these sharks became remarkably popular. I think two of them, Mary Lee and Catherine have over 80,000 Twitter followers. <laughs> Remarkable. So the sharks seem to have an oceanic phase, an offshore phase, where they wander out into the middle of these oceans. And here in the North Atlantic, when they wander out there, they started doing amazing things. This is a graphic that shows deep diving behavior. These sharks were going to depths as great as 1,000 meters, three, over 3,000 feet every day moving through a broad temperature range, ranging from very hot tropical water at the surface to near frigid down at depth. And of course, the question for all of us as scientists, and you too, is why? Why are these sharks doing this? Here's a coastal predator, a shark that we always thought of as being a top predator of seals, of sea lions, feeding on whale carcasses, eating fish, staying close to the shoreline, occasionally biting people. But no, these sharks actually spend a considerable amount of time in the oceanic phase, wandering off. And the question just gnaws away at us scientists. Why? What are you doing out there? Because while well, this wonderful technology was telling us where they were going, but not what they were doing. And I really wanted to know what they were doing. And we all kind of hypothesized about it, right? Well, they're going offshore to feed. No, it's reproduction. They're going to go wander about the Atlantic and find the mate and reproduce. Or is there some other factor that's calculated into this that we have no idea? So I wanted to know why. But I thought about how do we answer that question? You know, so the idea came about. How do we answer this question? Well, we've got submersibles. Why don't we just hire a big ship, put a submersible on it, and go find a needle in a haystack? No, not feasible logistically or economically. But what about a drone, a robot? And we use those all the time nowadays. And technology for drones and robots has really, really taken off. So I thought about this, and I approached my colleagues over at the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution that specialize in robotics. Only don't call them robots, and they don't call them drones. They call them autonomous underwater vehicles. <laughs> and these guys, they're, they're experts at what they do. They've, they've 
developed this technology over decades. You can see the different shapes and sizes of these things, and they send them down to depths that we can't routinely go to. And they map the bottom, and they find wrecks. They've imaged the Titanic. These are amazing instruments. So I sat down with the engineers over there, and I said, I want to follow a fish. And they said, Greg, <laughs> our AUVs can mow the lawn, but they can't find a fish. I'm sorry. So my, my hopes dimmed. And that's what happens. And that's some of the lessons we've heard today. You know, life is a roller coaster ride when you try to chase a dream or, or, or an idea. Logistically, it doesn't always work out. So I sat there and I was tenacious. And I said, well, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. How do you go about getting this AUV to do what you want it to do? Well, we send it messages through an underwater modem. I said, okay. And how do you get it back to the boat? Well, we use this thing called the transponder. And the transponder communicates directly with the AUV. And the, the, and the AUV will come to the transponder. And then something clicked. Something snapped. Something happened there. And I said, wait a minute. Back up there. The AUV goes to the transponder. I said, what if I take your transponder and put it on a shark? Because something I've gotten really good at the last 30 years is putting things on sharks. <laughs> and they said, you know what? I suspect that could work. And so we began to look at the technology and the right vehicle to do this with. And we started with what's called the, what they call the Remus 100. It's a smaller vehicle that goes to about 100 meters deep. And on the right side of the screen, you see what the transponder looks like. And so working with engineers at Huey, Roger Stokey and Amy Kakulia, we started doing sea trials. And with the funding from Discovery Channel, we were able to make these early steps happen. And basically what the technology does in very simple, simple terms, because I don't fully understand it. I'm just a biologist, right? Um, but these engineers describe it to me as just a highly sophisticated game of Marco Polo. <laughs> the AUV goes, Marco! And the transponder goes, Polo. And the AUV goes to the transponder. Hence, we follow the fish. Now, it's far more complex than that. And the most work ever done on this machine is all internal. It's in the software, the algorithms that allow this machine to make decisions based on a randomly moving object. And to me, that's fascinating. So we went out in 2010 and did a bunch of sea trials on great white sharks off the coast of Cape Cod. And this is one of my favorite sharks. We affectionately know her as Large Marge. <laughs> Large Marge, as you can see, has the transponder on her. And the early versions of this transponder were very uh, cumbersome. Now, I want you to know immediately right at the get-go that these transponders actually come off. We don't keep them on the sharks. We want to get them back. And so we tracked Large Marge and four other sharks during that period. And we were able to the first time actually follow a fish. And not only follow the fish, but image that fish. And here you can see the AUV following the shark. And we saw these really sophisticated tracks that we were able to generate uh, right off the coast of Cape, Cape Cod. Very similar to the track generated by Frank Carey, but done by a robot, not by a person sitting in a boat. And in addition to that, we were able to get images images of those sharks so we could see what they were actually doing as they moved along. With this success, we built upon it, and that's what you want to do. You take these baby steps and you keep building, you keep building. So we took the baby steps, and then we wanted to take the show on the road. So we went to Guadalupe Island, Mexico, where the water is deep and clear and there's lots of white sharks. And we tracked these animals with another AUV, again, the Remus 100, but with better algorithms, better software, all tweaked by the engineers so that the decision making was amazing. And we were able to get, again, remarkably fine scale movement data for these sharks. Here you could see two uh, movements. Again, remember what Frank Carley had to go through to do this, and now we're doing it with robotics. And in addition to that, we were able to, you could see how we tracked the animal in three dimensional space. So here's a shark, deep blue. Deep blue is a big fish, really big fish, big female, mature. We followed her over the course of a couple of hours, and you can see how she dove down and the vehicle followed her and how close we stayed together with her. So I'll show you some images from that particular mission, and I'm going to show you this from the perspective of multiple cameras that are on the AUV. Here you can see the camera pointing up, the one forward, 
right, left, down, and then one pointing backward. And that's in the lower left-hand corner. And here you can see the AUV tracking the animal, tracking deep blue as it moved along. And you'll see it come up closer and closer and image what this is animal, animal is doing. This is down at 60, 70 meters deep. All right, we've never seen the behavior of a fish or any marine animal at that depth without having to go there ourselves. And now we've got a vehicle doing that for us. She's staying very, very close to the bottom as she moves along the shoreline there. And the hypothesis from the Mexican scientist that I work with down there is that these sharks stay deep because they're hunting deep. So we tracked another shark named Lupita. And Lupita's another mature female, but Lupita went down below the depth limit of the AUV. So already I'm up against a limitation. But we can fix that. That's fixable. And when you could see Lupita, she followed the, the AUV to a point where she stayed above the shark. What we actually saw then amazed us. We didn't expect this. So there's the AUV kind of moving right along, moving right along. Lupita's somewhere 50 meters below. And we're trying desperately to to get Lupita to come up. Well, Lupita didn't come up. <laughs> that surprised the hell out of us. How do you make an engineer cry? <laughs> As these images we're coming back to us. I felt that we were seeing some, I felt like, you know, mission control as images of Mars came back. It was monumental. And, and this shark continued to follow the AUV like, was so mad that this thing did not die. <laughs> and you will see right there, it barks something in shark language and then moves off. I think of that as a huge success because we're able to track and image these animals, and even discover new behavior. We never thought white sharks were feeding uh, at that depth with such rigor and force. We thought they might be feeding and foraging on along the bottom. Um, the next step for us, of course, are to make it better and better and better and better, and that's what we want to do. You know, we're going to go deeper, we're going to go longer, we're going to use bigger vehicles, and we're going to keep building on what, the foundation of what we've been able to achieve. Uh, we're going to go back to Guadalupe, we're going to deploy new vehicles, and we're going to keep it going. And we're hoping to make this technology something that's used in the future to study not just sharks, but a variety of marine animals, from sea turtles to seals to whales, animals that move away from us, that go to places that we can't routinely go to. For me, it was a dream, you know? It was a dream to become a scientist and to do this, you know? But what's important to me also is to get this information out to the public, to share that information so that they become educated about the marine world. And with education comes respect, and with respect comes conservation, preservation. I had a wonderful life, and I've come a long way since watching television on a couch in Connecticut. But ultimately, I want to see a white shark track to the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. But I may not, I may not see that, but now I know at least it will happen. Thank you. <laughs>